Chapter 10, Our Lady Help of Christians. It had already emerged clearly enough that Don Bosco's dreams had an uncanny knack of coming true. And it will be recalled that in October 1844, right at the beginning of his work, just as he was on the point of leaving the Convito to take up his duties as chaplain at the Refugio, much of the development of his future apostolate was shown to him in a dream of some detail. The immense quadrangle surrounded by doorways with a church at the end was an accurate enough description of the Salesian Mother House and the Church of St. Francis de Sales, which took the place of the makeshift chapel in Penardi's shed. It will be recalled also that in the dream the lady showed him a second and immense church standing where before had been a field full of corn and vegetables. This field was the wasteland to the south of the oratory. It had once belonged to Don Bosco but he had been obliged to sell it at a loss at a time of great need. To say that Don Bosco had not forgotten his dream with the two churches would be less than the truth. It was constantly in his mind, particularly when the church of St. Francis de Sales, which he had built at such cost and with no little difficulty, began to grow too small for its purpose. In the Valdocco district there were some 2,000 of the population of Turin living on the fringes of two parishes whose churches were a couple of miles apart. Some came to St. Francis de Sales, but what with all the boys for whom it was primarily intended, there was little enough room for everyone, and the atmosphere became stifling. Increasingly, it was borne upon D Don Bosco that he must build again, and one night, here in confessions until very late, he seems to have come to a decision. It was the evening of the 6th of December, 1862. Coming into the house for his supper at about 11 o'clock, he appeared to be preoccupied. I have been hearing so many confessions, he remarked to Father Albera, that in the end I hardly knew what I was about. The whole time I was obsessed by one idea. When are we going to build a bigger church? Ours is much too small. The boys are packed so closely together that it is pitiful to see them, and there is hardly any room for outsiders at all. It will mean a large sum of money. Never mind. If God wills it, he will give us the church. Two days later he returned to the subject, remarking that he wished to honour Our Lady under the title of help of Christians. The times are evil, he concluded, and we need her powerful help to keep and defend the faith. So it is to her, under that title, that I mean to build the church. It will be the mother church of the congregation. Our Lady Help of Christians shall be the foundress and the permanent supporter of our oratories. Why did Don Bosco choose this particular title for Our Lady, among all those to be found in the litany of Loretto. The answer must be answered perhaps by another. Why does anyone choose some particular practice, some special devotions? Probably because it suits their mental makeup, state of soul and temperament generally. From his earliest days he was a remarkable for his devotion to Our Lady and the fact that he honoured her and spread devotion to her under the title of Auxilium Christianorum may be regarded as a matter of personal preference. He was certainly instrumental in propagating it through the world, for wherever his Salesians have gone, they have taken it with them. Then too, at the period in which Don Bosco lived, it was, so to say, topical, it had been associated since the 17th century with invocation of Our Lady's help against the dangers besetting the Church. 
one version of the Litany of Loretto, approved by Clement VIII in 1601, contains the invocation. It is said to be only another form of the older invocation, Advocata Christianorum, and it has been asserted that it was included in the Litany by St. Pius V after the Battle of Lepanto, but there is no evidence for the statement. The feast was instituted by Pius VII some years after his captivity at Savona and Fontainebleau in thanksgiving for his triumphal return to Rome, and the date chosen, the 24th of May, commemorates the date in 1814 on which he entered his city after six years' absence. During Don Bosco's adult life, the church in Italy was going through an especially difficult period. It is possible that the difficulties of the time led him to adopt this particular form of Marian devotion. It goes without saying that he had nothing towards the building of the great church which he saw so clearly in his mind's eye. He possessed, in fact, neither the site nor the money nor even the necessary municipal permission to put up a church in the Val d'Oco quarter. Such difficulties were, of course, no deterrent. He acquired the site, but was obliged to negotiate for it through a third party, because the owners, it was known, would not sell to him. Then the municipal council, it was understood, were willing to give the necessary permission but would never agree to the proposed title. It concealed, they imagined, some political significance. It seems hard to believe that they were so well aware of the historical background of the Feast of Our Lady Help of Christians, yet that must have been the case. At all events, it will be recalled that in 1862, the government of Piedmont was on very equivocal terms with the papacy and may well have felt uneasy supposing that Don Bosco's scheme formed part of some cunning policy designed to favour the Pope at the expense of the government. Don Bosco prudently mentioned no name for his new church and the plan of providing a building in which the inhabitants of this poor quarter of the town could worship was authorised by the municipal council. Work began in May 1863 with digging out the site to a depth of eight feet, no small undertaking when it is realised that something over a quarter of an acre required to be dealt with in this way. At this point it was discovered that owing to the nature of the ground and to the proximity of the river it was necessary to sink piles to a depth of 60 feet for a firm foundation to be obtained. These preliminary expenses, together with the cost of fencing off the site, swallowed up a gift of £20 from Pius IX and donations from Prince Amadeo and many others. The story of the building of the Mother Church of the Silesian Congregation is one of a cash box, always empty, and yet always replenished by some miraculous means. The contractor came to Don Bosco on one occasion, asking for an advance to cover the wages for the month. Here, Don Bosco said, You can have all I possess. Open your hands. And he emptied his purse into the astonished builder's hands. Four coppers fell out. Don't worry, added Don Bosco with a smile. The Blessed Virgin will surely find the money for building her church. I am only the cashier. You'll see. And that indeed was the principal impression produced by the course of events. Don Bosco imagined at the beginning that he would have his church for an expenditure of something like £10,000. By the time it was finished, it had cost upwards of 40000 the money was raised in many ways, by begging, by public lottery. He even asked, but was refused, 
a grant from the municipality. Yet the principle that guided him through all this is illustrated very clearly by a remark made to his bursar at the beginning of the enterprise. The latter had pointed out that there was no money left at all, not even enough to pay postage. Well, replied Don Bosco, we can make a start all the same. Have we ever begun anything with money in our pockets? We must learn to leave room for providence. In spite of the subscription lists and lotteries and people encouraged to pay for one brick at a time, money was frequently short at critical moments. And it is in this connection that Don Bosco begins to emerge very clearly as a wonder worker, a thaumaturgus, to use the technical term. In his previous life, instances of it were not wanting, but it is now that he first began to acquire the reputation for miracles that was firmly established at the time of his death, some twenty years later. The curé d'Ars used to as ascribe all the wonders and favours granted in his parish to the intercession of St. Philomena. That did not explain the fact that it was always his prayers that she seemed to answer, though it enabled him to hide his own light under a convenient bushel. When, in what appears to be the same way, Don Bosco ascribed everything to Our Lady, help of Christians, saying when the church was finally built and consecrated, there is not a single stone which does not stand for some favour granted by Our Lady, help of Christians. He was, in fact, showing to Turin and to the world of 1864 to 1868 that she helped in a very special way this much harassed priest devoted to her service. Don Bosco undoubtedly received special assistance from heaven in the furtherance of his good works, and this assistance came in answer to his prayers to Our Lady, and it came to relieve the corporal as well as the spiritual needs of those for whom he prayed. There are several instances of extraordinary happenings at this period, and it would be tedious to relate them all, for, on a final analysis, the ingredients are practically the same in each case. Yet some must be recounted, for they form an integral part of Don Bosco's life, and show us vividly his great trust in Providence and his reliance on Our Lady's intercession. On one occasion, Don Bosco had to find something like £160 to pay the contractors. It was the morning of the 16th of November, 1866, and the money was required for that evening. By midday, Don Rua, the bursar, and one or two of the Salesians had managed to scrape together £40 towards the sum needed by calling on various well-wishers in the town, but in so doing they had exhausted every possible source. This they told Don Bosco, and something of their dejection must have appeared on their faces, for he reassured them with a smile. That's all right, he said. After dinner, I will go and fetch the rest. After dinner, then, he went out, though he seemed to have little idea where exactly he was going. Having wandered about the streets for a short time, he came eventually to the principal railway station. There he was accosted by a servant in livery. Are you Don Bosco? asked the man. I am. What can I do for you? My master has sent me to ask you to come and see him at once. The house was nearby, and Don Bosco was ushered into a large bedroom with a middle-aged man lying in bed. The whole surroundings betoked considerable wealth. Father, said the invalid, I have sent for you to ask your prayers to set me on my feet again. How long have you been ill? I have spent the last three years suffering in this bed. I am unable to move, and the doctors give me no hope of improvement. 
If you obtain for me even slight relief, I would be willing to make an offering for your charities. That, replied Don Bosco, is indeed fortunate. This very day I need a hundred and twenty pounds to pay the contractor for work in the church I am putting up. A hundred and twenty, gasped the invalid. Ten or even twenty I might manage, but a hundred and twenty. Too much, inquired Don Bosco. All right, let's talk of something else. He sat down and changed the subject, but the invalid persisted. What about my cure? he inquired. I told you how, and you refused, replied Don Bosco. But a hundred and twenty pounds. Finally it emerged that the invalid had not the money in the house, and that part of his difficulty was he could not go to the bank to obtain it. That seemed no difficulty, Don Bosco, and he told him so. But you're joking, father. I haven't been up for three years, and you talk about my going to the bank. Nothing, replied Don Bosco, is impossible to God and Our Lady help of Christians. He gathered together the people in the house, there were about thirty of them, and kneeling round the bed, he bade them pray, himself leading them in a short prayer in honour of the Blessed Sacrament and of Our Lady. Then he told them to fetch the invalid's clothes. A further difficulty thereupon arose. None could be found. But the invalid himself seemed to be imbued with confidence. He told a servant to go out and buy something to wear for him. Finally, clothes were brought. The patient put them on, ordered his carriage, and despite the protests from the doctor, who arrived inopportunely at that moment, set out for his bank. A little later he was back in the house with the money in his hand. I am completely cured, he kept on saying. You get your money out of the bank, Don Bosco summed up the situation, and Our Lady gets you out of bed. On another occasion, an old friend of Don Bosco's, Commentore Cotta, was slowly dying in Turin at the age of 84. This is the end, he told Don Bosco. In a very short time I shall be leaving you for eternity. Not at all, was the reply. Our Lady still needs you in this world to help build her church. Of course I would help you, but as you see, there's not the slightest hope left for me. What would you do, inquired Don Bosco, if Our Lady restored you to health? For six months in succession I would give you eighty pounds towards your church. Very well then, I am going to back to my boys now, and I shall ask them to pray for this favour. Three days later, Don Bosco received a visit from his friend, fully cured and in excellent health, bearing the first instalment of his promised offering. He was to live a further three years, and never failed to help Don Bosco to the limit of his means. Gradually, the church took shape, and by 1866, the outside was finished. A further two years were required for the interior stonework and embellishment. Finally, in 1868, the church was consecrated by the Archbishop of Turin, Monsignor Riccardi di Netro. For upwards of twenty years, since his dream, in Don Bosco's mind, he had seen the church with its great dome surrounded by the statue of Our Lady, and at recreation with his boys in the playground, often he would point out to the place where the church was to stand and tell them to look to the south. Look up there, he would say. Can't you see Our Lady's statue with the halo of light around her head? On the evening of the consecration, many of the boys, now grown to manhood, were to witness the fulfilment of Don Bosco's prediction. The statue, standing nearly ten feet high, in mass of copper, was illuminated and a halo of multicoloured lights were set around it. How Don Bosco has transformed this part of Valdocco. The visitor who approached it nowadays along the Vita Cotolengo comes suddenly from the somewhat narrow street 
into the Piazza Maria Auxiliatrice and face to face with the monument to Don Bosco by Gitano Cellini, which was put up in 1920. It stands there dwarfed by the great Renaissance-style church with its dome lighted by 16 windows and statue rising some 180 feet above ground level. Don Bosco was well served by his architect Antonio Spezia, for both inside and outside the church gives the impression of grandeur. It is spacious with four lateral chapels and two others in the transepts, and behind the high altar three more in a circular choir. The two belfries, one on either side of the dome, are each surmounted by a cupola. The church is now a place of pilgrimage. Primarily, of course, it is the sanctuary of Our Lady Help of Christians, but within it are also the mortal remains of three canonized saints, St. John Bosco, St. Mary Mazzarello, and St. Dominic Savio, and of at least one other whose course is well on the way, Don Michael Rua, Don Bosco's faithful helper and successor. So large a church, completed in so short a time, represented, as we have seen, untiring efforts on Don Bosco's part, and an undertaking that, once more, would in many cases be deemed a successful life's work for most priests. Yet it was not by any means the only church that he built. Our Lady Help of Christians was hardly consecrated than he was thinking of building another church elsewhere in the town where it was needed, down by the railway station, in a poor quarter, and not unlike Valdocco in its general characteristics. The difficulties were great. He had to overcome the opposition of the Waldensians, who, too, perceived the suitability of the locality for their own purposes. And when these could not be realised as the means of hindering this energetic and tireless priest from carrying out his plans. From what we have already seen of Don Bosco, it is sufficient to say that all obstacles were gradually overcome and that the Church of St. John the Evangelist, one of the finest in this city of fine churches, was opened for public worship in 1882. Finally, towards the end of his life, at the request of Leo XIII, Don Bosco undertook the building of the Church of the Sacred Heart in Rome. But it is the Church of Our Lady, Help of Christians, that is his special monument in the land of his birth and in the city in which the greater part of his life work was accomplished. The names of Don Bosco and Our Lady, Help of Christians, are inseparably bound together, not only in historical record, but in popular esteem. That I learned on setting foot in Turin for the first time. In halting Italian, I inquired of the taxi driver if he could take me to Via Maria Auxiliatrice. Si, si, he corrected with some emphasis. You want Don Bosco.